Hi, I'm Bruce Moyer, Counsel for Government Relations to the Federal Bar Association. Thanks for joining this webinar, being recorded on Monday, April 6th. Today, we're going to take a look at how Congress has responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. We're going to review the three laws Congress has passed and their highlights. We'll also take a look at the age of congressional lawmakers and their potential vul vulnerability to the virus. And lastly, we'll look at the possibility of changes in the future governing how Congress does its business remotely. Okay, let's get started. During March, Congress passed three appropriations measures that provided increased funding to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. The first bill provided $8.3 billion in response funding, the second $100 billion in worker assistance, and the third $2 trillion in payments to individuals and families and loan assistance to companies. The remarkable thing is that Congress, for all its chronic dysfunction, was able to pass these three measures within a short period of only three weeks. Let's take a look now at each of these three measures passed in three phases by Congress. The phase one bill was an $8.3 billion measure that provided emergency funding for vaccine research, along with emergency preparedness and public health agency support, loan assistance, and humanitarian assistance. Phase two was the family's first Coronavirus Response Act. This legislation included new employer mandates for paid sick leave and paid family leave related to the pandemic. It also allowed employers to recover the cost of the mandates through refundable payroll tax credits. Phase two included a total of $104 billion in new spending. The third phase three legislation is the largest of the three. It is the CARES Act, a massive 880 page, $2 trillion relief measure. Unlike the earlier packages, the CARES Act includes numerous important tax relief provisions for individuals and businesses. Most of these provisions are temporary measures designed to quickly put money into the hands of taxpayers by delaying tax payment obligations. Also, creating refund opportunities and using the tax system to make direct grants to individuals. $500 billion in the bill is being made available for lending to industries, states, and localities. Another $500 billion is made available in loans for small businesses. And $100 billion is also made available to hospitals. For those of you who are doing work for clients to determine their eligibility for assistance under the CARES Act, you well know that the implementation and the guidance from Washington under this legislation continues to remain a work in progress. Congress is currently in recess, and both chambers are not expected to reconvene until April 20th at the earliest. When Senate and House lawmakers do return, they are expected to pass a fourth phase four COVID-19 relief measure, possibly even bigger than the CARES Act. Meanwhile, Congress will face pressure to extend the FISA law, welfare and tax extender laws that will expire in May. And as the fiscal deadline of September 30th approaches next fall, Congress is likely to pass a continuing resolution that extends 2020 federal spending levels until late in the year into the next fiscal year, past the November 3rd election. Now, the COVID-19 epidemic presents policy challenges to Congress. It also presents personal challenges to the 435 members of the House and the Senate. Already six lawmakers are known to have contracted COVID-19. The larger potential consequences are considerable with a substantial number of lawmakers 
in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, especially in the Senate, where nearly half the members are 65 or older. And some have chronic conditions of disease that put them at even greater risk. All of this has created a greater amount of discernment and introspection as to how Congress does its work and whether Congress should revise its voting procedures to permit its business to be done remotely. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell have pushed back on rank and file calls for Congress to consider remote voting. Congressional leaders have argued that establishing an unprecedented voting system in the middle of a pandemic holds illegal and logistical risks. Yet the alternatives may involve making hundreds of lawmakers travel and congregate in Congress, thus risking exposure to themselves and others. Not being session at all presents further risks to the Republic. Current voting procedures in both the House and the Senate involve unanimous consent and roll call voting. Only the House permits voting by electronic device. Several changes have been proposed to permit more flexible voting procedures. These include the expansion of voting by proxy, remote voting, extending the time for voting to reduce chamber crowding, and raising the unanimous consent threshold to require more than one member to object for a UC motion to be blocked. This concludes today's webinar. As we know, this is a historic and unprecedented period for our country, and I hope all of you and members of your family are remaining safe and adhering to your state and CDC guidelines. The Federal Bar Association is here for you and your professional success, and has compiled resources to help our members stay connected and informed. Please visit the FBA website at fedbar.org for more information. This is Bruce Moyer, Council for Government Relations, saying thank you for tuning in.